Okay, um, welcome to chapter, what is this, chapter 11 on plants, talking about plants today, and I haven't really changed the slides, we're just going to go through them again, and hopefully help explain a few things about plants, maybe tell you some things you don't know. Obviously you're familiar with what plants are, plants are all around, plants are very good for the elementary classroom because you can grow them very easily, you can study them easily and you can do experiments with them and you won't get in any trouble. If you don't treat mice correctly, you can get in trouble. You know, if you don't treat grasshoppers correctly, you probably won't get in any trouble. But basically, the more complex the animal, if it's a mammal or whatever, the more rules and regulations there are gonna be about it. Plants, not so much. You can probably keep plants in your classroom regardless of who your principal is. So plants are good that way. Um, and just like with the animals, there's going to be plant taxonomy. There are going to be scientific names. And uh, plants, like animals, are multicellular. Uh, unlike animals, they don't have nervous systems. They don't have muscular systems. They're not moving around. Why? Because they don't need to they are acquiring food. Right? They just need to hold still and capture that sunlight. Now plants do compete with each other in a variety of ways. Um, they compete with each other for the sunlight, for water, for nutrients. Um, and even though it's kind of slow motion, uh, plants sometimes carry out warfare with each other. They'll, they'll put out chemicals to inhibit another. Uh, they'll strangle each other, they'll parasitize each other, so so it's not all just love and peace among the plants, even though they don't seem to be doing much at any one time. Okay, uh, the scientific names with plants, it's similar to animals. It's still kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Uh, plant people want it to be a little different than animal people. And so instead of calling it phylum, they use the word division. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit outdated. And in fact, uh, some of these slides, it, it kind of has outdated information. And the systematics, taxonomy, the studying of how things are related and how we should name them, I mentioned already. But with genetic information, it's changing very, very quickly. It used to be that all you could do was look at the morphology, look at the shape of things, look at, you know, if you were trying to describe a new species of lizard, you might be counting the number of scales across the width of its body or taking all these measurements very carefully. Nowadays, the genetics gives you so much more information about how things are related. So these classifications are being rewritten all the time. It's a very messy time right now in in biology in general just with naming and renaming and ordering things so that's okay we'll stick with the information that's in the book it's it's more historic it's more kind of so a lot of this is kind of outdated but that's okay uh, a lot of it does still apply and, and even things that have been changed people still understand the old system so v division or phylum bryophyta yeah, there's more than it's been split up and, and and all that. So, but within the kingdom of plants, kingdom planty, uh, a big group is the non-vascular plants. Well, it's not a big group. It's the 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 vascular plants are much bigger, many many more species. This is more primitive, the non-vascular plants. So, just like we talked about the transition to land with animals. You know the kind of the features between fish, amphibian, reptiles, and and making that transition to land. Plants also had to transition to land, and that means getting out of the water, getting away from the water, dealing with a, a dry environment. So the it, it it's not a surprise that the more primitive plants are more dependent on being right at the water or being in a very moist environment. So they don't need, they don't have true leaves. These are the mosses, the liverworts, the hornworts. Um, they don't have true roots. So roots, primary function of roots is to draw water out of the soil. 
these guys can anchor themselves to the soil, but they don't have a vascular system. And what I mean by a vascular system, they don't have a system of tubes to carry liquid. You have a vascular system. It's the blood vessels that you carry your blood around in. Plants have a vascular system. Most plants have a vascular system. It's the tubes that they're carrying water uh, from the roots up the shoots, out to the leaves, um, and also for carrying sugars, sugary water solution down from the leaves to the to the shoots and to the roots. So uh, these guys, the bryophytes, bryophytes are again the mosses, the liverworts, the hornworts. The bryophytes have no vascular system, so they are non-vascular plants. Now, tracheophytes, these are the vascular plants. Now, here's my trachea, right? If you feel your Adam's apple, your larynx, and you can feel a little bit, there's a tube. It's a little uncomfortable to feel it, but you can feel your trachea. And if you're really clever, you can kind of feel that it has rings along it. It's kind of like a vacuum cleaner tube. It's held open by, by rings, ring structures. Uh, that's what tracheophyte is referring referring to as a plant with ring-like structures in the cells. The cells are ringed by, um, by a compound, I think it's lignin, is the main feature of these vascular cells. Anyhow, uh, two types of vascular cells. One for bringing the water up, so this is the xylem, and another kind for bringing sugars uh, and other carbohydrates down, that's the phloem. And there's a lot more traffic going up. The sh the, there's a lot more water that's flowing up than sugar's flowing down. But both are important. Uh, within the tracheophytes, so these, think of your trachea and how it's kind of firm and held open. The tracheophytes have cells that are always, the, the passageway is always open and it's for transporting, for fluid transport. So these tracheophytes have two big groups within them, the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. Now gymno actually means naked and sperm means seed. Um, so let's go back to the Greeks, sperm, uh, seed. They thought, they thought that, that men had little people seeds in them and that during intercourse, that the man would plant seeds into the woman. They didn't realize that the woman had, you know, a, an egg cell, uh, but they they thought that they were planting little people into the into the woman. Um, so sperm simply means seed. Gymno means naked. So you're looking at that and thinking, hmm, now what about the gym, the gymnasium? Well, it turns out that. Uh, the Greeks, they started gymnasiums and it was a place for wrestling and, and sports and, you know, pre-Olympic pre -Olympic sort of games. Uh, and it turns out that they did them in the nude. So in the gymnasium, the men were all nude. I guess it was a man thing. I don't know. Anyway, so gymnosperm means naked seeds. And they're not naked in the sense they don't have clothes on. They're naked in the sense that they don't have any sort of fruit around them. Uh, it's just the seed, no fruit. So we'll talk about fruit when, the, when we talk about the angiosperms. And, and I don't know why they choose the word angiosperm. Because an angio is like a vessel, like an angiogram to look in the heart. Anyway, um, okay, gymnosperms. Who are the gymnosperms? These are the more primitive group of tracheophytes. So cone, they have cones. They don't have, they don't have fruits. Um, so, you know, I said that, and then here are these little berries you know, on a juniper tree. It's kind of like a fruit. Well, technically it's not, I guess. Anyhow, um, their their leaves don't look like the same. They look different than they're more scaly leaves, or or they are pine cone, pine needly. You know, they're scaly or needly. They stay on all year round. Um, 
but it, ha it mainly has to do with the uh, seeds. The gymnosperms have seeds that are without fruit. Okay, um, within conifers, conifers are the pine trees. That's the biggest group of gymnosperms. And again, gymnosperms are one of the groups of tracheophytes. The other group is angiosperms, and that's most plants. So most plants are angiosperms. If they're not angiosperms, they're most likely gymnosperms. If they're not angiosperms or gymnosperms, then they're these, you know, little simple things like the mosses and the, you know, they're the bryophytes. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, this is one interesting thing about the transition to land. When you're in water, sperm can swim. And you think, well, sperm swim anyways. Well, yes, they do for animals. Sperm can swim, but they have to swim in a moist environment. So either external fertilization like a fish you know the sperm are just put into the water and they go find an egg hopefully um, well plants used to have swimming sperm pollen obviously does not spit swim you know when you breathe pollen in it's just like a dust uh, but pollen is plant sperm that's what it is it's the male gametes of plants well if you go to a primitive plant like a moss or hornwort or a liverwort or even a fern, um, they produce swimming sperm. And they're not very good at swimming across land. So they have to, you know, they mostly rely like on a raindrop hitting them and splashing them and hopefully they happen to land on an egg. Uh, it's not a very effective thing. So you can see how this didn't work out so well and why mosses didn't take over the world. Uh, they, you know, they occur in swampy areas, they, you know, it, if they're lucky, the sperm are going to swim that far, uh, you know, a few inches. And so uh, the gymnosperms, they're not doing that. Okay? This is a male cone. These little ones are male cones. This big one's a female cone. The male cones produce pollen, which is, it's sperm. Okay, it's, it's sperm that gets carried by the wind or by an insect. Um, so gymnosperms mostly rely on wind to disperse their seed, their sperm, not, not sperm, egg, getting together, it's plant sex. Okay. Um, so with conifers, we're going to, you know, which are the main group of gymnosperms, we're going to distinguish very quickly between pine trees, spruce trees, and fir trees. And you may look and say, well, they're all pine trees. Well, yeah, kind of. They all look, you know, if you said pine tree and somebody said, oh, no, that's a spruce. Or, oh, no, that's a fir. You just smack them on the head and say, it's a pine tree. Um, they are all related. They're, you know, they're just different groups of conifers. And maybe next time you go choose a Christmas tree, you can decide, is it a fir or is it a spruce or is it a pine tree? It's probably a spruce or a fir tree. They don't do many pine trees for Christmas trees. Maybe if you go cut your own. The pine trees, the needles come in little packets. In other words, uh, when you pull the needle, it, it's attached to you know, two or four at the base. Um, so they come in little packets, and they're pointy, uh, which is why they're less likely to be a Christmas tree, because kind of, they can be pretty pokey. Um, but sometimes, sometimes I see pines uh, for Christmas tree. So pine trees, pointed needles in packets, spruce trees, um, mainly it's the blue spruce, so you can just kind of look at it, but uh, you can see that the needles are single, okay? they're not in packets, and they're kind of squared off. Um, I don't think they're too squared, but uh, they're pretty pokey, they're pretty sharp, and so if you just grab it, they're, they're, they're fairly sharp. Uh, especially con compared to a fir tree where they're very soft. Um, these guys are also, are they singles or doubles? Um, they're, but you can see that they're flat and they're soft, they're flexible. I, I think of it as like, you know, the fur of an animal. You can pet it. You can pet a fir tree. Uh, so fir trees are popular. Uh, the spruce trees are popular for their looks. The fir trees are popular. I mean, they can look good, and they are nicer to the touch for a Christmas tree. Okay, so those were gymnosperms, and there are some other gymnosperms, but conifers are the main, the biggest group. Uh, angiosperms are more recent 
uh, like at, around the time that the dinosaurs got wiped out, that's when angiosperms were appearing on the scene. And the interesting thing is how they took over the world because most of the plants are angiosperms. And this mode of reproduction that they have with flowers and fruits, that was very, very successful. And it's interesting that the last 65 million years, there have been so many partnerships made between all these different angiosperms and the insects and so much coevolution. Uh, and so the plants and the insects, they're very dependent on each other in a wide variety of ways. And sometimes, you know, oftentimes the, the insects are predators on the plant. So the plant has to create defensive chemicals to fight it off or, or just have ways to deal with insect attack. But on the other hand, the insects are the, the, you know, the main way that the plant is going to get its pollen spread and sometimes it seeds as well. So th there's a lot of co-evolution going on here. Uh, so this is by far the biggest group of plants, the angiosperms. They are the flowering plants. Uh, anything with fruit is an angiosperm. Some things you look at and you think, hmm, well, there's no flower there, there's no fruit, must not be an angiosperm, like a gr you know, the grass. Look at, the, look at your lawn. You don't think of that as having flowers or fruit. Well, it's still an angiosperm, technically. And it technically makes a little teeny tiny flower that doesn't really look like a flower because it's not showing off for anything. It's not trying to attract a bird or an insect or anything. It's just using wind pollination. So its flower doesn't look like a flower in the way we think of flowers. Um, and it certainly doesn't produce a fruit that you would think of as being a fruit. But, uh, but a seed, sometimes we think of it, you know, we, oh, that's the seed, but sometimes there's more to it than just the seed. Anyway, we'll just keep it simple you know, and focus on fruits that we think of as fruits. Uh, anything, any, any, any plant that drops its leaves in the fall is called deciduous, and it's just going to be an angiosperm. We can, I can tell you that. Uh, not all angiosperms do drop their leaves. There are plenty of angiosperms that don't, but, but if they do drop their leaves, yes, they, they are an angiosperm. That's another thing that has evolved. Um, you know, why keep the leaves during the winter if they're not doing you any good? Okay, here's a seed of an angiosperm, and it's a little more advanced than a gymnosperm seed. I don't know, maybe check the book. I don't know how many different parts you need to know. Uh, there's the seed coat that keeps the whole thing protected, it's waterproof, it's hard. Uh, that allows the seed to sit for a very long time, potentially, you know, years sometimes, uh, waiting for the right conditions. Now, the radical is a little piece that grows out of the seed first, that sends out the very beginning kind of the root. And um, a big part of the seed is called the cotyledons, and this is going to be food for the young seedling. Now we think of it as food for ourselves, or a bird thinks of it as for food for itself. Uh, you know, we like to eat the seeds, but no, technically it's, you know, when, when, well, plant a bean, you know, or just, just take a bean and let it sit on a wet paper towel for a couple of days, and these parts will start to develop, and, and when you see the radical coming out, then cut it open, and you'll see the immature leaves, you'll see the part that's gonna form the stem and the roots, um, you can see even this micropile that lets the water in on a bean seed. Anyway, um, a seed is a plant embryo. It is a baby plant. It, it has already been fertilized. It has already started to grow, and then it stopped. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, an, well, it, animals don't do this really. Right? An animals, once fertilization has taken place, the embryo, um, the embryo continues development, right? And, and it grows until it's a baby. Uh, that's typically how it goes with animals. With plants, that's not how it goes. Fertilization happens, the embryo starts to grow, and then stop, stop everything, put it on hold, 
wrap it all up in this tight little package, send it off on its own. Good luck. You, you know, no parental care. I've given you some food. Hopefully you'll survive. And that's it. So anyway, if you have some corn for the 4th of July, as you dip that into the pot of boiling water. Think of all the hundreds of embryos all crying out at once. Ah! Um, because that's what's happening. You're killing all those little plant embryos. <laughs> Sorry to say. Um, there's the cotyledon after after um, it's grown a bit. You can see that the, the cotyledon, or the, they're not really leaves, but they kind of fold out and the leaf the first leaves grow up uh, between them so anyway they look other pictures whatever you need to know about plant anatomy based on the book look look for some other pictures online you can find a lot um, so one thing a plant can't do is take its seeds to a new home take its embryos and find a new home for them and so it just has to send them out and they're on their own and Obviously, they can't just go walking or flying away or swimming away, but they have some clever ways of getting to where they need to go. Um, so different ways to get to get plants, seeds, baby plants, little plant embryos to new homes. Uh, they might be carried by the wind, like thistle or dandelion fluff. You know, there's a little seed attached to a parachute and up it goes. Um, Here's a maple key, it's called. It's just a maple seed. It has a little wing thing to it, and it, it helicopters down. And hopefully, you know, there's a bit of a breeze, and it helicopters farther away. Uh, falling into the water, coconut can travel around in the ocean for a very long time uh, and end up on the shore of some other island and start to grow. Or, boy, there's a, I think it's called the ocean bean. Me, and I get seed dispersal. If you search for seed dispersal videos, you'll get some good ones. Um, there's some really clever ones. Um, uh, let's see if I can pause this video. As missile systems go, there are smarter weapons than the Copa de Mer. No sound effects in the armory of plants is bursting with ballistic devices. In plants, but they're all designed to launch their seeds on self-propelled journeys, free from the dependence of animals. Okay, I don't know what I just missed or what I just showed you. I was trying to show a little video about the secret life of plants and about plant seed dispersal and showing. Um, seeds getting shot out or different things that seeds can do I think that I accidentally did not record all of that um, so I don't know what I did or didn't so I'm not going to go back uh, so some cool ways beyond what we're talking about here uh, now seed dispersal with animals uh, here's here's something that's kind of like velcro you know a burr it sticks to you it sticks to fur um, gets carried for a long ways that way uh, enticing animals to eat the fruit is the plants way of getting the seed far away you think well what good does it do to the plant if you eat the fruit uh, well the answer is that the seed can survive your digestive tract a lot of time so this is bear scat my wife had her first job in biology in college was picking through bear scat and identifying the seeds of the different plants that the bears had eaten so bears will find a bush with ripe fruit and they'll just gorge on it and they'll just eat everything and bears do what they do in the woods and then if my wife found it she had to pick through it and identify what it was that the bear had eaten anyway so you can imagine for the seeds this is a great benefit they're brought to a new place. They're put down with some fertilizer and a hundred of their friends. Anyway, um, plant parts, roots, shoots, leaves, very basic for kids. Uh, now with roots, you can compare tap roots to fibrous roots and, you know, ultimate tap root is like a carrot, uh, but just a root that just goes straight down. 
grasses are a very good example of fibrous roots that spread out and hold on that way and plants show geotropism which is a tendency to grow down with the roots in other words they can sense gravity uh, and so they a plant knows up and down and and you can you know experiment with this you can have a plant planted in a clear plastic cup or something so maybe you can see the roots uh, get it growing and then tilt it on its side and watch how the how the stem goes up and the roots have to curve down um, the stems support the leaves they extend from the roots why have stems why have a trunk why go up why go up well it's because plants are competing with each other for sunlight so if you can go up and then put out your leaves then you've got all the sun you want it's kind of like you know imagine well where my parents lived they have some great views they have some great views so a person builds a house and they got a great view well if the next person comes along they want a great view so they put their house here now my parents don't have a great view anymore these people have a great view so the next person comes along and they put their house here and you know it's whoever's furthest up on the mountain has the best view uh, same plants the one that gets highest can spread out and have all the sunlight and everybody else gets a little less uh, this is going to be a big issue in you know sunlight as a limiting factor is more important in a place that has lots of water so in the tropics if you go walking through a tropical jungle it's pretty dark because the plants are competing so heavily for the sunlight that they're blocking it off from getting you know very there's very little light coming down to the ground now out here water's a limiting factor and because the water's a limiting factor the plants can't cover the sky you know they can't trap all the sunlight as you know that's not that's not the limiting factor there's plenty of sunlight not enough water it is more the limiting factor here but this is why you know this is a big reason to go up you know maybe go up also to get away from predators you know if you're a, a tree and some mammal likes to chew on your leaves getting up high enough maybe you can get away from that so in a stem in a trunk just you're gonna see different types of cells we're not gonna go through all of them but you'll have vascular bundles with the xylem and the phloem the xylem shown here in pink is the water going up and the phloem shown in purple is the watery sugary solution coming down and there are different arrangements of these vascular bundles depending on what type of plant it is uh, this is one of the features that they used to use well they still do uh, to distinguish you know like different families of plants based on the arrangement of vascular bundles in a tree uh, it's going you know this is not a tree this is just like a flower or something in a tree the phloem is going to be right under the bark and so if if a beaver or something comes along and eats all the way around or a, a scout with an axe takes off the bark all the way around uh, the tree will die right because it can't get nutrients down to their roots anymore they've cut off the flow and cut off the flu uh, I'm gonna not read all this because you can read by yourself about what's going on but the xylem's carrying the water up it's mostly water but also the minerals uh, and I don't like the statement in this plants are like huge pumps that's a little bit misleading because plants don't actively pump water they don't have a heart they don't have any mechanical system they're not pushing the water up rather it's drawn up because the the these cells these xylem cells are are microscopically narrow and they're stacked on top of each other and it's just this continuous um, narrow tube and the water because of the polarity of the water you know the, remember the adhesion and the cohesion so it just sticks to the walls of the xylem and it's just very drawn and it just keeps m m making its way up 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 
and when it finally gets out to a leaf there's a there are a bunch of holes in the leaves and so the water's taken all the way through the leaves and these holes oop, there goes a water molecule and when one water molecule escapes it kind of pulls on the whole column of water and plant has how many thousands you know a tree could have thousands of leaves all of them losing water through all these tiny little holes so a big tree it might be losing a thousand gallons of water um, every hour into the atmosphere now in the tropics that's not an issue so all these tropical trees thousands of gallons of water going up and then it rains back down later in the day here in the desert the plants have to deal with trade-offs you know they don't want to lose thousands of gallons of water if they're out in the middle of the desert not getting water so we'll talk maybe a little bit about those trade-offs or things that they have to do to conserve water but the trade-off you know why why do they even do this well two reasons they need they need water for photosynthesis because they're combined you know they're they're taking apart water molecules remember photosynthesis carbon dioxide and water to make those sugars so that water is one of the ingredients to make a glucose molecule so you have to take apart the water another part of this is that um, well that's the main reason why they need the water up um, but the other problem is that they need carbon dioxide into the leaves and the carbon dioxide can't come into the leaves unless they have an opening in the leaf and they have hundreds of small openings in the leaf and so if you're letting carbon dioxide in oops water's getting out so all this water that plants are losing into the air it's not that they want to just throw water into the air they, it's just that they can't help it so if you don't want to lose water if you're a desert tree and you're trying to restrict the water loss you can close those holes but as soon as you close the holes the gas the carbon dioxide can't come in so you can't make sugars so you can't grow so there's this trade-off the plant wants to grow it has to open up these stomata to let the carbon dioxide in if it does that water's going to get out and the plant may dry up so it, it's a trade-off if water is limited then it has to slow its growth down and this is why desert plants sometimes grow very very slowly because they can't afford to just open up their pores open up these stomata to get the gas in uh, unless it rains and so they can only grow occasionally okay so the phloem is bringing the sugars down to the roots to the stems and and by the way the xylem the cells in xylem they're dead cells but they still function so they they're just dead little tubes but they function fine dead um, this is not the best picture of leaves but it's uh, showing phototropism bending towards the light so you've all experienced this you know if, it, if you have a house plant inside you know, bends towards the nearest window um, so geotropism is the roots sensing gravity going down phototropism you know the plant bending towards the light and it might be fun uh, you know just get some plant seeds in the classroom get them wet like a bunch of wheat or alfalfa or something get these little sprouts going up um, it might be fun to clip off different parts and see if they still bend and you know there's some experiments you can do there do they, you know, how do they sense the light leaves uh, there are several slides about leaves and I'm going to just talk quickly about them but the petiole is the the stalk of the leaf and it's going to attach to the stem and then the blade is the main leaf part and when you just grab a leaf that's the blade of it and you can see veins that's vascular tissue that's xylem and phloem bundled together going out to the different parts of the leaf and leaves are green because they are filled with chlorophyll which is the well it's the molecule for photosynthesis so chlorophyll molecules are in these structures within the cells called chloroplasts we're not going to go into great detail about photosynthesis it's pretty complicated um, and but you know it works anyway 
Uh, so plants, why are they green? And the funny thing is that because they can't use green light. What light, you know, sunlight has all the colors within it, but it just, it looks just like sunlight. It just, it doesn't, it's just white light. Um, but you know, my shirt is green because green is what's getting reflected off of it. It's absorbing the reds, the blues, uh, uh, the, you know, the other pigments that's coming in and it's reflecting the green. Same thing with a leaf. A leaf is green because it reflects the green part of the, of the light spectrum. It absorbs the, the blues and the reds and it can use those parts of the um, electromagnetic spectrum to carry out photosynthesis. It can't use the green. It reflects that back out, hence the leaves are green. Uh, if you look at the veins on leaves, they might be parallel, like in a grass leaf. A uh, piece of grass is a leaf, pretty much. Uh, they might be pinnate, where they go out. Uh, like that, palmate, where they go like the palm of your hand, like fingers kind of. The shapes of the leaves, this is kind of crazy to break it down into this many shapes. Linear, oblong, glancellate, ovate, oblancellate, obovate, deltoid is kind of triangular, oval, orbicular, and peltate, chordate. Eh, this is too many different classifications in my opinion. I mean, how is a person going to distinguish between oblong and oval and oblancellate and ovate? You know, where do you draw the lines? It's a little crazy here. Obovate. Hmm. Check in your book. See if, you know, if it's in your book, then maybe you're supposed to know this level of detail. Hmm. Leaf margins. That's, that's, this is okay. Here's a leaf. Just an entire leaf. And it's just got this smooth margin. The edge of this one, the margin of this one, is undulating. It's a little waviness. This one is serrated, you know, like a saw blade. This one is doubly serrate. It's a saw blade that has, you know, a tooth within a tooth sort of thing. This one's dentate. So it's kind of like the undulate, but little... It's like little teeth dentate, little teeth uh, poking out of the leaf. Crenate. Now, where do you draw the line between dentate and crenated? I couldn't tell you. Lobed. You well, know, you know, around these veins, it, it kind of goes in further, and we have you know more lobes. Parted. Well, those, you know, where do you draw the line between lobed and parted? I don't know. These pinnate leaves that are lobed or parted um, and here's lobed on a palmate leaf now why is it not parted I don't know so um, okay leaves come in different shapes here's a simple leaf meaning that one leaf on one petiole here's a palmately compound leaf this these, you, you might say, oh, one, two, three, four, five leaves. No, this is one leaf. This is one leaf because there's one petiole, one attachment to the trunk or to the stem here. Um, so these are really leaflets. Same thing here. So palmate leaf, this is a, called a compound leaf. It it's, looks like many leaves, but it's just one leaf. Same thing here. Looks like one, many leaves, but it's one leaf. And you can see that, you no, know, it's just, it was lobed. It's kind of like it was lobed, but then the lobes became more and more distinct until they looked like individual leaflets. So simple leaf, compound leaves. And you can go and look. You can find compound leaves. Just look to see, you know, the if there if there's one attachment to the stem. And there's there's usually a little bud right at that attachment. Photosynthesis. I like people to know this equation, but I don't know if it's, I, I didn't make the tests, but uh, carbon dioxide, water, making glucose and oxygen. And you balance the equation, Y6 is, well, sugar has, this is, this is glucose, six carbons, 
12 oxygen, six ox, 12 hydrogen, six oxygens. Um, I could draw it for you, but I'm going to skip that for now. What happens is you say, well, okay, this is what's coming out. So if I am making a sugar with six carbons, well, then I need six carbons over on this side. So they're just balancing the equation. That's why the sixes are there. But the plant's not counting. It's not counting out, okay, let's see, I need six water molecules here, six carbon dioxide molecules. And this is, an, you know, this is showing what are the ingredients coming in, what are the ingredients coming out. But, but it acts like, you look at this and it looks like it's one step. There are many steps to photosynthesis. And taking apart the water and, you know, what, how are you transforming this carbon dioxide in water? How do you do that? There's a light reaction, there's a dark reaction, there are many steps within, you know, many different enzymes involved. If you want to learn more about photosynthesis, enjoy it. Look it up. It, it gets pretty complex. But where's the water coming from? From the roots. Where's the carbon dioxide coming from? From the air. So here's an interesting thing. One of the very first experiments with plants a guy took a, you know, a tree seed and he planted it in a big pot. But first he measured out exactly how much dirt he had. He weighed it when it was totally dry. He said, okay, I've got 200 pounds of dry dirt right here in this big pot. Now I'm going to put one tree seed and I'm going to start watering it. And he did this and he let the tree grow for five years or ten years or something. And then he, you know, took out the tree chopped it down into little pieces. He weighed the tree. He weighed the tree. He took out the roots. He cleaned off the roots. He gathered up all the mud. He dried it out. And he said, okay, now that this tree has grown, and I don't remember how much the tree weighed. Let's say it weighed 100 pounds. How much soil do we have? Well, he still had his original 200 pounds of dirt, more or less. And he's like, this is interesting. We started with 200 pounds of dirt. We still have 200 pounds of dirt, but somehow we added 100 pounds of tree. So he thought, huh, the only thing I've added is water. So the tree must be made mostly of water. Somehow it built itself out of water. What he didn't realize was that the tree is mostly made out of carbon and that it got it from the gas, from the air around. So even though carbon dioxide is less than 1% of our atmosphere, that's what plants are taking in to build themselves. So, and look into, you know, hydroponics. You can grow plants without dirt. They just need water and, you know, some basic minerals. They need the minerals. You can put those dissolved in the water. So plants don't technically need soil, technically. I mean, you Yes, in the wild they do, but anyhow, so carbon dioxide and water, you're building sugar molecules, and oxygen's just a byproduct. It's a good byproduct for us because we like to breathe, um, and all animals. But. Oh, taking a closer look at the leaf, there's an epidermis, a skin that covers it, so to help not lose quite so much water, but within that epidermis, especially on the bottom of the leaf are many holes and you can barely see them probably in this slide uh, but they're called stomata or one single well st stomates um, and that's just a hole you know you could say that my mouth is a stoma um, it's an opening there are guard cells around that can be that can close off this hole so it can be closed or open closed or open and there are hundreds if not thousands of stomata across the, the surface of the leaf and in the more tropical region you'd see stomata on both sides on the top and the bottom because water is not an issue P putting them on the bottom that's a water saving measure right because the sun is hitting the top you're going to have less evaporation if the openings are all on the bottom um, you're not going to lose quite as much water 
and having a thick dermis, having a waxy covering, having little hairs on the leaves. There are a lot of things the plant can do to try to not lose as much water. Um, again, vascular tissue, we, we're going to see xylem and phloem, and, these, and it's going to branch out to every little piece of the leaf. Uh, and, and the cells of the leaf, I mean, they just, it's a watery little environment in there. Uh, changing color, why do leaves change color in the fall? And you're, you're going to see this one further north, you know, where it gets cold. Um, basically, it's funny. Uh, chlorophyll will break down when exposed to sunlight. You know, just like a colored piece of paper left out in the sun will lose its color. Well, a plant leaf left out in the sun will lose its color. Plants have to rebuild their chlorophyll all the time. And that takes energy. Um, and so as the days get shorter and the nights get longer, and at some point the plant decides, you know, it's not worth it. It's getting cold. It's getting dark. Um, and there's just kind of a, a trigger and so it stops rebuilding the chlorophyll and so that starts to break apart and the oranges and reds and yellows some of them were already there to begin with but you couldn't see the colors because the, there was so much green so much chlorophyll so they start to show up as the chlorophyll breaks down some things like the purples weren't necessarily there but as the compounds break down chemical reactions occur and you get some new colors as well and um, each leaf is an organ and the plant is saying oh, I'm done with you and it builds a little wall and it cuts off the food supply well the water supply to that leaf and so the leaf builds a little wall here and now they've got two little walls and crumbles and it falls off the leaf falls to the ground um, so the plant you know gets what it can out of that leaf but then the leaf falls falls away um, flowers are reproductive organs. Funny, we don't uh, we don't put other reproductive organs on our tables as centerpieces, but we like to put plant reproductive organs as decorations. And um, so, why would you have all these decorations around your reproductive organs? It's not to attract another flower. You know, a flower is not trying to look sexy for another plant. It's trying to look interesting for an insect or a bird uh, or whatever the pollinator might be. And so, you know, this is just to advertise, hey, if you come on over here, I'll give you a little treat. And so the insect comes over and it's like, where's, where's the treat? Where's the treat? And the plant's going to hide the treat way down here. It's going to put some nectar clear down here or something. And so the bee or the butterfly or whatever in trying to get to the little bit of nectar to the prize that the, that the plant is offering it's going to brush up against these anthers that are coated with pollen and so then it gets this little sip of nectar that wasn't much you know the plant only puts a little bit out at a time so it has to fly to another flower and look for it too and as it's going down maybe it brushes a little bit of the pollen onto the stigma so the, the anther bears the pollen, which is the, the sperm. It's the male part, the male gamete. It's a sperm that doesn't swim. So, and it transfers the sperm, the pollen, to the stigma. And that's the site. This is, it's interesting. The, the, the eggs, the, the female part, is clear down here. Right, so wait a minute, we just deposited the sperm clear up here, but they can't swim. They can't swim. So what are they gonna do? They actually have to grow all the way down. They make a pollen tube and they have to grow and then deliver a nucleus into the egg. So the so there's an ovary. At the, you know, take apart a flower. Go go look at some flowers and the shapes will differ, but look for the stigma which is on a style and at the base of it is the ovary and if you break that open you might see little kind of like miniature seeds uh, that are the the eggs the ovules uh, so usually centrally located you'll find the female part of the flower the male part of the flower 
is these anthers that are held up by filaments. And together, the anther and filament together is called a stamen. So usually there are several stamen, usually one stigma in a flower. It's highly variable, highly variable. So try taking apart several flowers to look for these structures. Um, down at the base is the sepal. That's the little green part that you know was enclosing it before it opened up. So sometimes the sepals are colored. Uh, sometimes there are no petals and there's just a colored sepal and it looks attractive anyway. So a lot of variation in flower anatomy, but you know beyond the petal, uh, look for look for the female parts, the stigma on a style with the with the ovary down here. Together that's called the carpal. So the female parts together is the carpal, the female reproductive structures, the male reproductive structures are the stamen. And um, maybe just a quick point that plants are hermaphrodites most of the time. Most of the time a plant has both male and female reproductive organs on the same plant. And it has lots of them. Okay, pretty different than animals. You know, we're used to thinking of an animal, one penis or one vagina with one uterus, and you know, okay, two ovaries, but um, not so with plants. You know, might have flowers all over the place, and each flower has both male and female parts. If they're not moving much, they're sure thinking about sex a lot. That's what it looks like with these plants. Okay. Um, Pollination is not quite fertilization. Pollination is when the pollen gets to the stigma and fertilization is after the pollen tube has grown down the style and into the ovary and so fertilization is when sperm meets egg, right? So pollen is just, pollen contains multiple nuclei and some energy and it has to grow um, but the nucleus that the carries the genetic material, you know, it has to get into the egg and then that's fertilization. Now some plants self-pollinate where their own pollen can land on their own stigma and they produce, you know, seeds. They produce baby embryos, little embryos that way. And that's fine. Others cross-pollination. They have things, you know, they don't accept their own pollen. So again, variation. Um, interesting story. Which plant was it that was so hard to figure out how to get it to pollinate? Oh, darn. I'm having a mind blank. There was a good story I was going to tell you, but I can't remember the plant. And without remembering the plant, I can't tell the whole story. Sorry. Fruit. Fruit is not for the plant. It's not to look sexy to another plant. It's not even to attract pollinators because the pollination has already happened. So fruit is after the flower has been pollinated, after the fertilization has happened, and now the plant has been preparing the embryo with a seed, which includes a food source and and protection and everything that seed's going to need to start its journey. So the seed is the embryo in a package. And around that seed is often a fruit to entice an animal to take the embryo and take it to some other place. Okay, You spit out any watermelon seeds lately, you're doing the plant's job just as it wanted. Take the fruit, spit out the seed, or poop out the seed, or something. Get it someplace else. Um, now, plants produce large quantities, and because most of them do get digested or die, uh, you know, we eat beans, we eat poppy seeds, we eat peas, uh, we eat corn. That kills the embryo. Okay, so other times, other times we eat the fruit without killing the embryo, like that bear scat. Um, so it, it just varies. Other times we throw it out, so you eat a cherry and you spit out the embryo. 
or you know and, and that's a great way for seed dispersal or you eat the apricot and you throw away the pit because there's this big hard covering around the embryo so just different strategies different strategies for plant reproduction pretty crazy um, plants also don't even need to reproduce sexually necessarily you can you know plants can often reproduce asexually very nicely you know a cutting can grow into a whole new plant and this is very helpful for us because then we can have seedless fruits you know when you look at a banana cut open a banana sideways you see these little dots these little dots those are aborted embryos terrible to say it that way but uh, those are seeds that didn't they weren't viable they didn't work because we produced a mutant banana that has an odd number of chromosomes so fertilization happens but every baby dies and it's terrible to think of it that way but it's great for us because it's seedless so seedless plants are genetic they have genetic problems they have an odd number of chromosomes an extra set of chromosomes okay so down syndrome a person has one extra chromosome of the 26 you know it's an extra chromosome 21 well what if a person had a whole set of extra chromosomes they wouldn't survive well neither would a banana baby survive that way and so they're seedless but we can still grow these banana trees because we can just grow them from cuttings so the fact that plants oftentimes are able to reproduce asexually allows us to kind of induce genetic mutations so all their babies die and we have this whole line of plants that that can't reproduce sexually but they can reproduce asexually and they still produce fruit and so great we love them um, underground stem parts that we might eat bulbs are uh, like for tulips or uh, you know these are just energy reserves to come up in the spring tubers again it's just energy reserves it's, it's kind of an underground stem that gets all full of starch um, and we like to eat those um, or like an onion so we use seeds we use fruits we use the roots um, we use stems we use leaves we use flowers we use plants extensively now I don't know if the plants think they use us extensively but corn and rice and wheat and beans they have benefited hugely from us in the sense that they've taken over the world you know they're dominant they are dominant plant life on this planet how many millions of acres of corn are there millions of acres of rice so <laughs> you know they suffer now they don't technically suffer they don't have a nervous system um, but you know we're eating their babies all the time but we're also helping their babies all the time and we're planting them and caring for them and so is corn at our service or are we at the service of corn kind of hard to say okay I'm tired obviously we better end here so hopefully you learned a few things about plants and maybe see them in a different light bye for now